As soon as I found out that we were doing a series called Toxic, I got on Amazon and ordered a full body, bright red, skin tight Britney Spears jumper. And I was gonna come out here today and perform Toxic for y'all. And I showed up this morning and I was told in no uncertain terms that I needed to change. And so I borrowed some clothes uh, from the worship leader. And anyway, um, I'm on the stage today. Uh, hey, we, we were making this point that we are hypersensitive to the things that we put in our body, like more than ever in our culture. Like we, we used to count calories, but now we, we like measure whether a calorie is good or bad, whether it's an empty calorie or whether it has value. We, and I just wanna say, I, I think we need to stop judging calories. All calories matter, that's what I think. And uh, anyway, we, we just live in this world where we're so sensitive to what we're putting in our bodies, and on top of the calories, we want things to be now organic, which as somebody that grew up on a farm and put a lot of chemicals on a lot of vegetables, uh, I just I kind of have pushback against that. I, uh, I was at the store not too long ago, and I got a bunch of groceries, and I was in the checkout line, and I realized that I had accidentally gotten organic bananas, and so I was like, I just don't need that in my life. So I went all the way back to the bananas, put back the organic, and got the synthetic ones, or whatever those are made of. Apparently we print those up in a 3D printer somewhere, but... Uh, but anyway, we're just very sensitive to the things we put in our body. But on top of that, man, if you think 2020 has been a bad year, can you imagine what's going to happen in our country if they actually find a vaccine? It's going to be a civil war between vaxxers and non-vaxxers. Like, it could tear our part, country apart because we're concerned about what we're putting in our body. There's going to be some people, on the one hand, going... I am not putting some cocktail that the government rushed into production into my body because they are concerned about their body. But on the other point, the other person who's just as concerned about their body is going to say, well, we have to take the vaccine because we have to keep the virus from me and my family and everybody else, so we should all take the vaccine. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be the end of our country if they actually find a vaccine. And I just want to make the point, this is the point we're making in this series, that it's fine that you're paying attention to what goes in your body, but something that's a way bigger deal is the behavior that we all engage in on a regular basis, basis that is toxic for our soul. And it's my job as a Christ follower to, to convince you or to inspire you that this is a much bigger concern because your body Man, as good a care as you take care, you can eat nuts and berries for the rest of your life, it's still gonna decay. It's still gonna decay, but your soul lasts forever. So we're gonna jump into, this is just a two-part series, we're gonna jump into the book of Galatians, and we're just gonna be in Galatians chapter five, and here's why this is so important, because this chapter is foundational to everything about Christianity. If you wanna understand the gospel, the, the stuff that we're gonna talk about this week and next week is absolutely fundamental, foundational stuff. Galatians chapter five, he just starts like this. In, in verse 16, he says, so I say... Walk by the Spirit, he's talking about God's Holy Spirit. He says, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now I don't want you to miss that, that is so important. In fact, we're gonna walk away from Galatians 5 and then we're gonna come back. But I want us to understand the concept of the flesh. When you look through the New Testament, you'll find this everywhere. All the different writers talk about this flesh that we have. And a lot of times they call it the flesh. Sometimes they call it the body and they distinguish the difference between our body and our spirit and they're kind of at war with each other and our, our body is driven by these base, self-gratifying natures and it wars against the things in our spirit. But one of the ways I like to hear it described the most is just our sinful nature because that's what this is. This concept is our nature. I don't want you to miss this because this isn't so important. And, and, and if you really want to understand the gospel, you have to understand what our nature is. You and I all, we all have a sinful 
nature. And it doesn't matter whether you're born in this country or not born in this country. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. We could all sing this song, red and yellow, black and white, our sinful nature is our plight. You just need to remember, it is universal for all of us. I want you to hear the way that the Apostle Paul talks about the nature that you and I all share in. In Romans chapter seven, he says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me. Just think about that for a second. We have a tendency to call ourselves good. We have a tendency to believe that people are basically good. We even sometimes tell people, you gotta just believe in the goodness of people. That is something the Apostle Paul would never say. He says, for I know that in myself nothing good dwells in me. That is my sinful nature, his nature, your nature, our nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I think we've all been there. A couple of hours before Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, literally sweating drops of blood, and his disciples fell asleep. And then Jesus comes to him and he says this, in Mark chapter 14, he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. You've probably heard this line before. The spirit is willing, but the flesh Your body, your sinful nature, it's weak. Now, if you didn't know this about you, this is probably one of the most important things you'll ever learn about yourself is to learn your own nature that you share universally with everybody on the planet. So I wanna give you a mental image so that you can remember uh, your sinful nature. Like I said, I I grew up on a farm, a hog farm in Nebraska, and as a As the youngest in the family, my job was to water down the hogs when they got really hot so they didn't get overheated in the summer. And so what I would do is I would go out to this patch of dried up manure and and dirt is basically what it was. I walk up to this patch and I just start spraying the water hose and all of a sudden these hogs would come up and they'd start standing under the water, you know. I'm spraying them down and then another one would come up and they would realize that this was a thing and so they'd come up and then they'd start pushing each other out of the way and then all of a sudden this manure dried up area would turn into nice soupy mud manure and then that's when they really started having a good time and they just plop down in that manure and ro- roll around squealing, <laughs> Right? I cannot think of a better picture of your sinful nature. (laughs) That is who we are. That is our factory setting. We are very involved in our self-gratification. So uh, no matter where you are, if you're watching online, if you're with somebody, if you're in in person in Saginaw, if you're in person in Monroe, if you guys are in here, uh, just just go ahead and turn to somebody that's near you and go... (laughs) Give it a try. All right. Because that's what we have in common. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. Because over time, a lot of us have probably asked this question, or maybe you've heard somebody ask this question. You look at something that's broken in humanity, and you go, what is wrong with people? Anybody ever do that? What is wrong with people? After today, you'll never have to wonder again. I'm telling you right now, you will never have to ask the question. And it doesn't have to do with generations. Each generation has a tendency, like younger generations look at boomers and they're like, man, they're messed up. And then boomers look at younger generations and like, young people today, right? We're always, (laughs) it's always a generational thing. It doesn't have anything to do with generation. It doesn't have anything to do with any country you're from. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what time you're living in. Every person that's ever been created has the same problem that we share in this sinful nature. Every negative headline, remember this. Every time you see something broken on the news, remember this. Every negative headline you see can be traced back to our flesh. 
Now, we don't like this. We don't like knowing that we share in sort of this universal nature. And so we have a tendency to do the comparison game where we point at other people and go, well, but I'm not like that, right? But I want you to know, we universally share in this. This is something that is common to us all. So if you'll do this with me, I want you to imagine the person that you consider to be the most evil. The most evil person in the world, the most opposite of everything that you value, they value. I know we're getting into a hot political time right now, so I can almost guess for many of you who this person might be. If you're a Republican, I can imagine who it is in your head. If you're a Democrat, I can imagine who it is in your head. You've already got it figured out. Or maybe it's not that. Maybe it's somebody down the street. Maybe it's a, a guy that you go to high school with or a girl you go to school with. Maybe it's somebody you work with. It's, it's just somebody that, man, they are pure evil. Okay, go ahead. Now get this image in your head. You'll know it because you'll just sort of envision their face and you'll see them going. <laughs> this is so important. This is so foundational to the gospel. This is so important if you want to understand why Jesus came to this earth. That person and you have the exact same nature. You are exactly the same. But here's what we would do with that. We go, no, 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 no. I would never do the things that they do. I would never, I would never spend my money foolishly like they do. I would never be promiscuous like they are. I'd never have the beliefs that they have. I would never act the way they do. I am nothing like them. And I just want you to know, oh, oh, yes, you are. If you were raised in the house that they were raised in, if you had the influence that you ha they had in their life, if you had the abuse that they had in their life, if you made stupid decisions early on because of the life they had that led to the life they now have, you would be exactly like them. You can't look at one person on the planet and go, I'm nothing like them. You are them. And, uh, and here's the biggest key, is we think, well, we've got we've, we've to have people that are good and we've got to have people that are bad and I want to make sure I'm one of the good people and not one of the bad people and you just need to know, no. We're all the bad people. Again, go ahead and turn to somebody next to you. <laughs> Go ahead and do that. It's, that's who you are. And here's, here's the truth. Legislation can never fix what's broken with humanity. Because that's where our mind always goes. We're always like, well, man, we see something broken in the world. And we're like, we got to get new leaders. We got to get new laws. Here's, here's what I would do. Like if I had to, we could get this all figured out. I got the whole problem. We just changed the laws. And I want you to know that that's never going to happen. Laws don't fix what's broken with humanity because what's broken with humanity is our nature. It's a heart issue. Just imagine that all of a sudden we came out today and said adultery is now illegal. I think we probably universally agree that adultery is, is bad. But if we came out and said all of a sudden adultery is illegal, do you think there would be less adultery? I think it might be a different group of people that I think there might actually be more adultery because laws don't fix what's broken with people. And this is kind of a sad note, but I feel like it's worth saying. I don't mean to depress anybody in here, but racism's never gonna go away. It's, it's always here. I support laws that try to end that or try to minimize the effects of racism, but but it's never gonna go away because of this right here, because of our sinful nature, because of the nature that we all share in. Our only hope is Jesus who came to fix the real problem. So with all of that information about our flesh, our body, our sinful nature, I wanna come back to Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five says, for the flesh, or he continues on, for the flesh, the sinful nature, the pig living inside of us, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. Now here's the deal, I, all of us know that. We've felt it. You don't even need the New Testament to tell you this. 
You have noticed the struggle that you have inside. You have these things that you want to be and these things that you don't want to be and you are unable to accomplish those things, at least for those of us who admit, admit it. We have these things that we want to be, these things that we don't want to be, and we are unable to accomplish those things. And so what we do is, we don't like that uncomfortable feeling, what we do is we, we end up justifying our behavior. Because at some point, every human being on the planet, if you're, if you're just scrolling through Facebook and you popped in here, I really want you to hear this. Every person on the planet has gotten to a place where they have felt utterly defeated because they can't be the person that they want to be. And so they're crushed. All of us are crushed underneath this weight of our own sinful nature. And so what we do to try to alleviate that is we justify it. As we start, this is our solution. We just start going, well, here's the things I can accomplish and the stuff that I can't seem to accomplish, that's just who I am. It's my personality, it's, it's, it's okay, I'm just gonna be who I wanna be, I'm gonna do it, and you justify that behavior. Here's what Paul's gonna do next. He's going to give us a list of these toxic behaviors that are a direct result of our sinful nature. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious, what he's saying is you don't even need a Bible to know this. He, he didn't even need to write these down. You guys already know them. Everybody knows them. And he's just gonna give us a list. And as he goes through one of these, each of these, I want you to just know, we, we look at this and we don't want to be any of the things on this list. So what we do is we, we relabel it. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality we don't do that very often. That's not, that's not something we put in our relationship status. What's your relationship status on Facebook? Sexual immorality. Like, we don't do that. But we do justify it. All we have to do is say, well, but, but we're in love. He says, impurity and debauchery. This is so easy to relabel, right? We just don't call it that. Nobody's ever come up to you after a party and gone like, hey, I left early. How was that party last night? And you're like, oh, man. It was wild, and then by the end of the evening, it was full-on debauchery, right? Not very often, sometimes maybe, but not very often do we call it. We just don't, we just don't call it that. Idolatry and witchcraft, many are like, ah, no, I don't do the idolatry and witchcraft stuff. You can keep moving on the list, but some of y'all mess around with tarot cards and and Ouija boards and trying to talk to dead relatives and stuff like that, and you kind of flirt around with that. And, and here's why that's so dangerous. Because essentially you're saying, God, I didn't like your answers, so I went somewhere else to find other answers. Hatred, discord, jealousy, those three, I know why Paul stacked those up together. They all kind of connect, and they are so easy to justify. You know how you justify that? It's easy. Don't do this, but let me teach you how to justify that. You just say, well, I'm just so passionate. I'm just passionate about this subject. I'm passionate about my country. I'm so passionate about my family. And boom, you have justified hatred, discord, and jealousy. And to tack one on, fits of rage. Next verse. He says, selfish ambition. It's so easy to justify. I'm just trying to get ahead. Dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, I, I don't think for most people out there there's anything wrong with having a beer. But two, three, four beers, how do we justify that? It helps me relax. Orgies, I'm not gonna touch that one. And the like, <laughs> and the like. He says, and the like. So the, the like is like, he's like, and, and all of that kind of stuff. He's saying, I'm just getting the list started. You could write a much longer list. I'm just trying to get you to, to see what's kind of right in front of us. And then he kind of lands a right hook. And I think this is really important, especially if you've been going to church for a while or in case maybe you've misunderstood what the grace of God is. I don't want you to miss this. Because here's his point. He ends this little chunk of scripture by saying, I warn you, as I did before, sometimes I feel guilty as a pastor for encouraging all the time, but never warning. So if you've never been warned about this before, take this as a warning. That those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom 
of God. It doesn't matter how you label it. It doesn't matter how you justify it. If these behaviors are in your life, it means that you are continuing, continued to being ruled by your sinful nature, by your flesh. And so he provides for us the answer. When you look at humanity and go, what's wrong with people? When you see the brokenness in our world and you think, man, what's wrong? And you, and you're going, and you think, I hope you, for the rest of eternity, you think to yourself, it's not going to be by laws. It's not going to be by legislation. How does this get fixed? There is only one solution. And the solution is in uh, Galatians 5, 24. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Not, hey, they've changed their behavior and they do better than other people. It says, no, they have crucified, they have put to death with Jesus their flesh with its passions and its desires. In a nutshell, what Paul is saying is he's saying, hey, self-gratification, next one, self-gratification is our nature, but Jesus offers to change our nature. Every other religion, every other moral code is just that. It's just a moral code. It's like, hey, follow these rules and don't, and don't do these things and do do these things and you'll be all right. And Jesus is like, that's not what I do. Many people are not attending church or not coming into church because that's, that's what they think the gospel is. That Jesus came and gave us the perfect amount of rights and wrongs and we just gotta get like an 80% on the test and we're good. And that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is Jesus goes right to the source of our problem. He addresses our nature. One more farm story, and then I'm done with farm stories. I spread. So we had corn on the farm, and one of my jobs when I was 15 was to irrigate the corn. Now, anybody remember being an idiot 15-year-old? Anybody in the room an idiot 15? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I remember being a vividly an idiot 15-year-old, but one of my jobs was to uh, irrigate the corn, so we had this ditch, and it was like a three or four-foot ditch that we would put at the front of the field, and then we would dam it up, and we would put these tubes in, and, but every once in a while, there would be a break in the ditch bank, and a little bit of water would go through, and then it would start eroding the entire ditch bank, and it would start to wash corn away, and it was a, it was a bad thing. So one day I'm out there uh, irrigating and I see a break in the ditch and it's only about two feet wide. So I jump over there with my shovel and I start slopping mud like crazy on this ditch bank and, and about every foot that I would fill in, about another two feet would break out. And so I was like, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have to work harder. So I just start slinging this mud like crazy and I'm out there for like an hour and a half and this breakout has become like 10 feet wide and I've covered like five feet like I am slopping mud, I got mud all over me, I am like stuck in the mud, I'm like into my knees, like in this deep soil, and, and then finally I see my dad, and he pulls up in the truck, and I'm like, oh, thank goodness. He's gonna jump out of the truck, he's gonna get on my side of the ditch, and we're both gonna fill this thing in together. But he doesn't do that. He drives up, and he looks at me, and he's like, hmm. and then he just drove away. And I was thinking, this is a life lesson, I'm sure, of some kind. I just need to work harder. And I was like, all right, I'll prove to him I can do it, right? So I'll just, I like started slinging that mud faster and I was sort of starting to catch up on it, but it was, it was still getting away from me. And then all of a sudden I noticed that the water sort of died down and it was getting a little bit easier and I was getting headway on it. And then all of a sudden the water came down to just a trickle and my dad pulled back up got out his shovel, jumped on the other side of the ditch with me, and I said, what's going on? He was like, I shut off the well. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> and then we fixed that up pretty simple. I just, I just want you to know, maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like that's your sin. You're trying to do this with your marriage. You're trying to do this with sexual immorality. You're trying to do this with lust. You're trying to do this with your pride. You're trying to do this with just these impulses that seem to be completely driving the bus. And you're slopping mud like crazy to try and fix it. Fix it. And you're, sometimes you even cry out to God. You're like, God, could you just come down and help me? Could you fix this? And it seems like he just drives on by. 
Because he wants to get to what's actually broken. He wants to put to death, not wound, not irritate, but put to death your sinful nature. And it's so simple. You may have never attended church in your life. This may be your first time watching or engaging anyway. It's so simple, you can do it right now. It's not a 12-step program. It's just really one decision that I wanna break into two parts. So we, I wanna talk about detox. Here's how we get this, here's how we get this poison uh, out of our life. Here's how we kill the sinful nature. It's so simple. First point, <laughs> just stop justifying toxic behavior. You can't surrender your sinful nature to be put to death if you're justifying the behavior. I think it's so important for us because a lot of times we, we get into this kind of pride feeling or this aspect where we just don't want to admit. We don't want to admit that we can't execute on what we want to do and so we end up justifying and, 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 and Jesus, just, just forget that. Listen to the way the Apostle Paul describes himself in Romans chapter seven. He says, what, what a wretched man I am. That's, that's Paul he wrote a good chunk of the New Testament. This is like our spiritual guide. We wouldn't even know what the Holy Spirit was or how salvation worked if it weren't for the Apostle Paul. And this was his identity. He woke up in the morning and said, what a wretched man I am. And we're walking around going, well, I'm basically a good person. That's something he would have never said. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You ever get ready in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, well, I guess I'm gonna take this out in public again. <laughs> you ever do that? Here we go. And so then you start like layering it, ladies, you kind of shellac the face and stuff and, and you start putting on the layers. I love fall. In summer, you know, the end of summer, I start to feel like kind of a fat guy and then, and then fall comes along and I'm like, boom, bomber jacket, guess who doesn't have love handles anymore? <laughs> and we kind of paint it up and we walk out into the public and we get that all kind of fixed and at some point, your concern for that breaks down. I got a guy down the road from me who has a body type just like me except a lot more hair and he mows the lawn in nothing but his shorts. Just out there, this is who I am, people. The shorts don't even fit, you know? And <laughs> at some point, you get to an age where you stop caring what people think. You, anybody at that age in this room right now? Two, all right. You're like 27, aren't you? Okay, anyway, um. It's too early for that. Anyway, yeah, we get to this point where we're just like, this is just who I am. I tell you, I don't know if you should do that physically, but I'll tell you this, like, that's exactly who God wants us to do, to wake up in the morning and not say, okay, I'm a good person. I'm one of the good ones. There's the bad ones out there. I'm one of the good ones. Don't do that. Wake up and say, I'm a wretch. I'm lost. I'm incapable. I've got nothing going for me. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And that was who, what Paul's identity was. I tell you what, I think this is one of the reasons we have such a hard time offering grace to other people because that's not our identity. Our, our identity is God kind of does some stuff in our life and we start to feel pretty good about it and we're feeling pretty good about what God's done in our life and then we use that good that God's done in our life to look down at other people and he's saying, I don't want you to do that. You wanna be free from your sinful nature? You want me to put it to death? Hold nothing back, lay it all out. Second step, there's only two steps. Start pursuing the spirit. We're gonna talk about this one a little bit next week or quite a bit next week. But for just for right now, let me just say, when, when you stop justifying that behavior and you start pursuing the God, God, it's just like that old analogy, I don't know if you've ever heard it, like people say, if you have two dogs, which one gets bigger, right? The one you feed. If you will put to death your sinful nature and you start pursuing the spirit of God, you will see God begin to work in your life. One of the greatest verses in the Bible, if you've never heard this, you need to memorize it, you need to look it up, you need to have this in your life. One of the greatest verses in the Bible, 
Paul actually er mentioned earlier in Galatians. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have put to death that sinful nature that has led to some of the stupidest decisions of my life. I have put to death that part of me that has led me down the wrong path. I have put to death this thing that has been driving the bus and ruling my life. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, in the body, the body that I'm stuck with until the day I die, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is where the power of God is. I wanna make this final point. You may not always see God's power. You may not always see God's power in global affairs, but you will always see him in the personal transformation of the willing heart. You may not look at the news every day and understand what God's up to, but this is where God's power is. If you wanna see God show up, if you wanna see him answer miracles, then you let him put your flesh to death. I'm not gonna lie to you, this isn't, this isn't a cakewalk. This isn't easy, it's a decision that you can make right now, but this is something you need a lot of support to accomplish. And you need to be doing it with other people that are on the same path as you are, other people that are trying to put to death their sinful nature or, or allow God to put that death, that nature to death. And so we've talked about rooted quite a bit, and I just want to hit it one more time. If you're uh, at home, if you're watching at any of our uh, other campuses, if you're in Saginaw, if you're in Monroe, if you're at any one of our seven locations, you're here in Brighton, I, I just want to tell you, you need this support. These groups, some of them are meeting in person. All of our campuses offer an online uh, ability to do this. But don't put this off. You need this more now than ever. If you haven't been in a rooted group, you should sign up for one today. And there's only one reason why I can think that you wouldn't. You know what that is? <laughs> Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray that today you would lead us all away from just trying to work harder or do more to leading us to living in your grace and, and chasing after your spirit. And God, as we do that and we stop justifying our, our behavior, or our life, Lord, I pray that you would put to death that sinful nature. Lord I, Lord, I pray that we would live in your grace, that we would truly understand what that grace is. And God, I pray that you would forbid, that you would guard us from ever looking at any other person on this earth thinking that we are any better. We are just sinners saved by your grace. And I pray that in Christ's name, amen. Right now we're gonna move into a time of encounter